Hello, and welcome to an exciting journey through the eyes of Marvin and Bernard Kalb, two of the most respected broadcast journalists of our time. Over a period of 70 years, these two brothers reported some of the world's most historic events and witnessed firsthand some of our nation's most turbulent moments. Marvin Kalb was a diplomatic correspondent for CBS and NBC News for 30 years. In the 1980s, he anchored Meet the Press. He also anchored the Kalb Report, a quarterly broadcast from the National Press Club, emphasizing journalistic ethics and practice. He has authored and co-authored 14 books, including his most recent, The Road to War, Presidential Commitments Honored and Betrayed. Today, Marvin Kalb is a senior advisor to the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting and senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. He is a professor of journalism at Harvard University. Bernard Kalb started as a reporter and columnist for the New York Times before he branched out into TV journalism at CBS and NBC News. He was a foreign correspondent for 15 years covering Southeast Asia during the Vietnam War. Bernard Kalb's career as a journalist took him to locations around the world, including Washington, Moscow, Beijing, Saigon, Paris, Antarctica, and many places in between. These two brothers have some wonderful stories to tell that will be both entertaining and educational. So sit back and prepare to take a journalistic journey as the Johns Hopkins Osher School of Lifelong Learning and Montgomery College's TV and radio students proudly present The Brothers Kalb, Here, There, and Everywhere, a lecture series that recounts the globe-trotting professional experiences of Marvin and Bernard Kalb. CBS News diplomatic correspondent Marvin Kalb. The Pope's slum, hit by two Raymond books. reduces the risk of war. Do you agree or disagree? Probably be for the last time. Marvin Cal, CBS News. Here we are, Marvin and I, and what we're going to try to do in a running theme throughout this few sessions we have together is to talk about the Cold War, which will evoke many memories for those of us here who are over 15. What we'll try to do is recreate some of the immediacy, some of the urgency that surrounded Cold War headlines that we're all familiar with, that we have all lived through. And essentially, we could have called this session of ours together here, Headlines We Were At. But Marvin escalated up to give it a much more geopolitical theme and so these will be variations of the Cold War as we cover them when both of us were at a particular headline, when one of us was at a particular headline, or where we were geographically at any time a headline erupted that caught your attention. Quick uh, bio of Marvin in a minute 15. Born, uh, then he... Uh, <laughs> uh, then quickly uh, in, the, in the after college, et cetera, et cetera, uh, an interpreter, Russian into English, and the other way around in Moscow. Uh, worked for many years as a diplomatic correspondent for CBS, for NBC, a professor at Harvard for about 10 years, teaching and founding the Shorenstein Center, the interaction of public policy and the press. And uh, I did a few things as well. Now, let's go on to uh, the, what we're talking about today. One little story I want to share with you about the years of crisis. When I was working as a correspondent for the New York Times in Southeast Asia, where I lived for about 15 years, I came back once at the end of the year on home leave, and Marvin was on one of these programs. I had not yet joined CBS, left the Times. And one of the questions during a live years of crisis finale was a question during the worst days of the Cold War. Fellow set up in the audience, live program, said, my question is addressed to Mr. Cal. Would you rather be red or dead? <laughs> I was in a living room on 79th Street in New York, wondering how I could deal with that question if I were at the recipient end of that challenge. 
palpitations, gasping. Marvin said, those are not my choices. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. Those are not my choices. But since we're talking about the Cold War, Cold War, let me help you dust off memories about the panoramic sweep of the Cold War from when it began, essentially, when it was headlined, the Winston Churchill speech at Fulton, Missouri in 1945. 46. An iron, <laughs> I told you not to do that. Uh, 1946, Churchill says, an iron curtain has descended across Europe, dividing it to two components. And in 1990, 90, 90, Marvin? 1990. Yes. Uh, 1989, 90, but, in 19, <laughs> but actually in 90, Gorbachev gets the Nobel Prize for peace. So you've got that span of 45, 46, the iron curtain, 90, Gorbachev gets the speech, and let me take a look, let me remind you, dust off a few old memories, of some of the hot spots during the, that particular period, from 45, the end of World War II, 46, all the way through. A few of these things. The Yalta Conference, 1945. Remember Yalta, the big table around Yalta? The United States and the bomb. First bomb, 1945, Hiroshima, Nagasaki. A Japanese surrender, World War II. Winston Churchill's speech, Marshall Plan announced to build an economic buttress against any threats from the Soviet Union from the East. The Berlin blockade begins, NATO ratified, Berlin blockade ends, Mao Zedong takes control of China in 1949. Soviets explode their first bomb. Are you remembering with me? Their first bomb in 1949. Uh, Korean War, just think of this cycle of fright and anxiety. Korean War, June 1950, Korean War ends 1953. Vietnam is split in two at the 17th parallel, 1954. The Warsaw Pact is, uh, emerges, created by the Soviet Union as a counter to NATO. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Sputnik goes up in 1957. Khrushchev demands withdrawal of all troops, Berlin. 1958, 1960s, uh, Soviet reveals U.S. planes shot down over Soviet territory. You remember that was on the eve of a summit that was suddenly canceled. Kennedy elected April 61. April 61, everybody? Yeah. Bay of Pigs, Cuba. Uh, Berlin border closed, 61. Uh, Berlin Wall begins. Cuban Missile Crisis, the worst of it all, in 62. Uh, Kennedy assassinated, 64, Gulf of Tonkin incident. 63. <clears throat> what did I say, 64? That's why you're here. Uh, 64, Gulf of Tonkin, Vietnam, the pre president announces 65, 150,000 U.S. troops to Vietnam, eventually it would go to 500,000 in Vietnam. August 68, Soviet troops crush Czechoslovakia in revolt. Apollo lands on the moon in 69. And on and on, Nixon extends to Vietnam War. Egypt, 1973, and Syria attack Israel. 75, the North Vietnam beats South Vietnam. The 80s are filled with it, et cetera, et cetera. I, I picked out out of this, uh, this tyranny of these events over those years, I isolated and described predictably, without any question, without any ambiguities. The Cuban Missile Crisis. Okay, that, that was the single most important issue, the most dangerous issue, but I want to back up just a little bit um, and tell you about my own experiences in Russia in 1956 before the Cuban Missile Crisis. At that time, um, we were three years removed from the death of Stalin, and less than three years after that huge event, Nikita Khrushchev, who many of you re will remember, a boisterous, rambunctious, reckless, most interesting, fascinating Russian leader, uh, takes over, and it is 56, it is the year of the thaw, and in February of 56, Khrushchev delivers a de-Stalinization speech, which says to all of the Russian people, Everything that you had believed in, every word that this man said, forget. We're entering a new era now.
we're trying to get along with the West. And we began to talk about mir i drushba, peace and friendship. And this is the theme for Russia today. So what Khrushchev did was bring the entire Politburo, all of the leaders of the Soviet Union, to every single National Day event in Moscow. So if you were a reporter, you can anticipate that Khrushchev would arrive at all of these parties, including the July 4th party at the American Embassy. At the embassy at that time, there were four people who spoke Russian, the ambassador, two officers, and a junior colleague named me. And I was assigned to look after Marshal Zhukov. Marshal Zhukov was small, round, and the great hero of World War II. And I made a deal with Chung, who was the Chinese butler at the American ambassador's home. And he probably worked for five or six secret services, <laughs> including, including the American. And I said to him, Chung, this is the deal. You give me water, and you give him vodka. <laughs> and so 11 drinks we had, the two of us. And I socked it back just like that. And he did his vodka and I did my water. And I stood straight. And as, as the marshal was leaving, he stopped. And there was the ambassador and Khrushchev. And Marshal Zhukov said, ah, I have finally met an American who can drink like a Russian. <laughs> And Ambassador Boland knew I didn't drink. So he gives me a look, and I give him a look of great innocence. And then Khrushchev looks up at me, and he says, how tall are you? I answered in a phrase, by the way, to this day that I can't figure out how I did it. But I said, I'm six centimeters shorter than Peter the Great. <laughs> Khrushchev roared with laughter. Thought it was a great line. I still think it's a great line. And, and, and he said, from that moment on, the many times that I saw him after that, he would always say, um, uh, here comes Peter the Great, whenever I walked over to him. Did you see our basketball game last night, Khrushchev asked. I said, yes, I did, sir. He said, did you see how great Lithuania was? I said, it was a good effort. I used to play basketball, and they weren't that good. And he said, they would win not only in the Soviet, they would beat any team in the world. And I looked at him and I said, with all due respect, Mr. Chairman, a good college basketball team in the United States could beat your Lithuanian team. At which point the ambassador looked at me and he would have punched me right in the face because it was outrageous to say that, but it was true. <laughs> and Khrushchev, Khrushchev at that point looked at me fiercely, but he had this way of switching from anger to feigned humor in a second. And so he went from anger to humor, then he began to laugh. And in a dictatorship, whenever the leader laughs, everybody laughs. So everybody was laughing. They thought that was so funny. Laughing was policy. That's right. And, and from that time on, he did give me, actually, two or three very good stories. And he was always giving it to me as a result of uh, Peter the Great and that story. So. It gives you a sense that Khrushchev, who led us into the Cuban Missile Crisis, was also a man of... of um, Let me, before you go into the Cuban Missile no, Crisis... No, I don't want to do that. I just no, to say just a that, minute. No, hang on. I just wanted to say that he was, um, if you all understand French, he was, Khrushchev, in his way, was a mensch. He understood... <laughs> He was able to grasp things from a human perspective. And one of the things he did not want to do was go to war 
but he did have enormous faith in the Soviet Union, and he thought it could do just about anything. You saw Dan Shaw here, who recently passed on. Dan Shaw, whom you've known for many years on radio and television. Dan Shaw used to tell a story about one of these July 4th affairs yeah. which Khrushchev attended, and Dan was there along with Marvin and other reporters who were covering Moscow on a regular basis. And Dan had made plans with CBS to take a vacation beginning the next weekend. But just a few days before the weekend, and just before the July 4th party was about to happen, there were rumors in Moscow that the Communist Party leadership would be holding a meeting on the very same day that Dan was due to depart from Moscow. That's a bad miss if you don't cover one of the most critical stories in your area. You don't leave town when the Communist Party leadership is meeting. So at this cocktail party out on the garden, Dan goes up to Khrushchev and he says, Mr. Chairman, I have a question. I am scheduled to leave on my vacation <laughs> next weekend, but now I hear that from rumors around town that your Communist Party leadership will be meeting at the same time. What should I do? Should I cancel? And Khrushchev said, Mr. Shaw, Gospodin Shaw, you go on your vacation, and if we hold such a meeting, we'll hold it without you. <laughs> I think, huh? No, I want to tell one story. Uh, on the Cold War, it's very quickly, it'll be a minute or so. The Cold War, to those of us who worked in the field, the Cold War would come to us as well. It wasn't simply US-Soviet. The Cold War affected the entire world. It affected your vocabulary, it affected literature, songs, television, uh, movies, etc. And I jotted down two things about the Cold War here. For example, I lived many years in Indonesia. Do any of you speak Indonesian? Otherwise, I'll stay with English. <laughs> in 1965, there was a, in 1965, Khrushchev, Khrushchev came to, uh, to visit Indonesia. And I just uh, pause here for a second to tell you that if you were one of the newly independent countries that emerged at the end of World War II, colonialism went to a quiet burial service, sometimes violent, but be that as it may, you had these new independent countries that were taking their first steps as free nations, and they chose a terrible time to do that. While they were still in diapers, these countries, Indonesia among them, the US and Russia moved in on them, competing for their loyalty and their allegiance and for their vote in critical times. And I say that following, for example, a night in the 60s, somewhere following Chinese Premier Zhou Enlai throughout Southeast Asia. He traveled, uh, Hungary, 56? Mm -hmm. Late 50s, I changed the time. Late 50s, Zhou Enlai, the Chinese Premier, China's free, free in, in its communist sense, only six or seven years, 1949. In 1956, Hungary is quashed, the rebellion in Hungary is quashed by the Soviet Union. Joe and Lai, nervous about the image communism will have, takes the Cold War to Southeast Asia. And he goes through the countries to reassure them that we Chinese will never behave the way the Russians, the communists did in the Soviet Union. We don't go around crushing countries when they try to express national aspirations. So no matter where you were, I was covering the China-India War in 1962, in a way sparked by Cuba or, or used at the same time as Cuba by the Chinese leadership, that no matter where you are, the Cold War had a way of intruding in your lives, your personal lives and your national lives. And again, as we, nobody in the world disagrees with this in any language, Cuba, the Cuban Missile Crisis was the zenith of horror, potential horror, the end, the extinction of civilization in October 1962. You all remember what it was like. I don't know whether you hid under desks, whether you were that young or that old. If you hid under a desk, raise your hand. <laughs> well, look at this, Marvin. Look at this. You got some of it. Look at that. Hid under a desk, Cuban Missile Crisis. That's children.
Uh, Todd, you know, it, it takes one's breath away. You know, I, I see Cuban Missile Crisis hiding under a desk. I think of it as, you know, something you read, but you're personalizing it now, and it's chilling. It's chilling to me. I was in Moscow then for CBS that entire week, that whole period. And I can tell you that in Russia, it was seen very differently. And I want to give you two illustrations that indicated for an American reporter in Moscow that we were not heading to a nuclear war. The first was I went very often to the central market in Moscow, which is open air, where peasants bring in their food, and where people living in Moscow buy most of their produce, because the stuff in Moscow was awful. In Russian, um, the words Khlebi Sol together means hospitality, Khlebi Solstva. They are the two basics in a Russian diet, salt and flour. The year before, in 1961, during the Berlin crisis, which was alluded to here, if you went to the central marketplace, you could not find salt or flour because they were both hoarded by Russians who instinctively knew that war was near, and if war comes, they have to have bread, so they would hoard as much flour as they could. Salt they needed for food of all sorts. When you went during the week of the Cuban Missile Crisis to the central market in Moscow, you could buy as much flour and salt as you liked, which meant that for the Russian people, there was no diving under desks. They simply did not feel that they were close to war. Incident number two. On Wednesday of that week, my wife had tickets to the theater, to the an opera, and Jerome Hines, the American opera star, was to be singing that night. Um, I said to her that I'm not going, I'm staying in the office. She said, yes, you are going. <laughs> because if there is some manifestation of a Russian desire, either for war or peace, you might see it there, and of course she was right. Not for the first time. <laughs> we went, and at intermission, Khrushchev arrived at the, at the opera that night with the entire Politburo. And he stood up and applauded and gave that big smile. And I'm sitting there about 15 feet away, and I'm saying to my wife, How did, did you know this? <laughs> um, no, but she had an instinct that we ought to be there, and she was right. And immediately after the opera ended, Khrushchev stood up, gave a lot of applause, and went around to, the, to backstage, and I raced along with him. And his Secret Service people, though they did know me, nevertheless allowed me to go through. And I overheard Khrushchev say to Heinz, um, we must find a way so that people like you can always come to Russia and Russians can come to America. We must find a way of living together. And I piped up, of course. Um, <laughs> do you feel, uh, Mr. Chairman, that we're going to find a way out of the current crisis? And he looked at me and spoke very slowly as if to say, I know you speak Russian, but I don't trust you, so I'm going to say it real slow. We can always find a way out of this crisis and other crises. We have to use our heads. How did he sound in Russian? He sounded. How did he sound? How did he sound in Russian? He sounded like he wanted to get a particular what was point the key across to me. In Russian? Uh, that there be peace. No, in Russian. <laughs> the. Um, I was very taken by that, and I did a broadcast that night describing that whole thing. The tone in the Russian press, where you got these clues, indicated that there were two voices. There was a voice that said, we cannot allow ourselves to be humiliated. 
We did something we don't think was a great idea, but we did it. Now we have to stick with it. There was another side, which I always felt was the Khrushchev side, saying, cool it, we've got to find a way out. What you just saw a moment ago when they spoke about the Friday letter and the Saturday letter, that first letter was Khrushchev writing it himself. It was a very emotional letter. The second letter was something quite different. It was very tough and straight. And Kennedy used his head brilliantly by ignoring the second letter, focusing on the first, sending a letter to Khrushchev, back to Khrushchev, picking up the theme of the first and saying, we'll get our missiles out, you take your missiles out. And for the world, that will be, uh, for us, that will be a swap. For the world, I'll give you something too. I will say that the United States will not invade Cuba. In other words, Khrushchev could turn to his people and say, we got something out of that as well. And that was the essence of that great deal that came together with on that Sunday. And finally, I want to say that on that Sunday, I was in the Central Telegraph. It was an incredibly tense day because we really didn't know which way it was going to turn. And a, a friend of mine who was a Moscow radio reporter came rushing in. I was there alone. Came rushing in, and he gave something to the censor. And I ran after him and said, what are you giving to the censor? And he looked at me with a slight smile. And he said, listen carefully, you will want to know this. And I said, me, uh, peace. And he went like this. And then he said, listen carefully, because the, the great, there, there is a great announcer, Gerasimov, who did all of the announcements during World War II. When you heard his voice, it was you know like Cronkite's voice. When you heard his voice, you knew it was something big. And he began to speak at exactly 5 p.m. Moscow time. I had a line open to New York. I fed the Russian broadcast through to New York. And when I heard the phrase, and we, with, and we will withdraw our missiles from Cuba, I jumped in and told the editor, the Russians have just caved, and that is the verb that I used. Kennedy heard that broadcast, and he said to the anchorman, David Schoenbrunn, he said, tell them not to use words like caved. I don't want to humiliate Khrushchev. Um, and so Schoenbrunn said to me, please don't use that word again. And I said, yes, I will, uh, and did because that's what the Russians did. They did cave, but we're all very lucky that they did. We hope you enjoyed this edition of The Brothers Kalb, here, there, and everywhere. Join us again next time for an up-close and personal view of the unforgettable events that shaped our nation and the world. And remember, you can always join the conversation on Facebook and Twitter. I'm Mary Kay Shardle Galato, director of the Osher program at Johns Hopkins University. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time.